Yo, yo, guys, here's my exclusive interview with the great, the one and only Brandon Ward. Please subscribe and click the like button if you want more content like this. What was different tonight? Was there anything different? I mean, you know, different things can happen during the fight, you know, once the, once the bell rings. But, you know, leading up to it, you know, and it's something you always forget. You forget how nerve. After every fight, the nerves like go away because it's over. You're happy, or if you lose, you're sad. But before the fight, the nerves and the anxiety that that you have is is it's so overwhelming. You know, like I'll, I'll be in the back. Some fights, I'll be in the back room, you know, getting warmed up, and I'm like, oh, dude, I'm never doing this again. No, this is it. This is it. This is the last one. You know, because those nerves are so. You know, that performance anxiety you have, you know, you're fighting in front of your home crowd, all your friends are here, the dudes you work with are here, you know, the whole, my whole state is here, you know, so you have that level of anxiety, you have that level, you know, of that, you want to fulfill everyone's expectations of you, man, it's, it, it's heavy, it's heavy, and I'm sure some guys handle it different, I don't handle it well, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself, man, I get real anxious and I get real nervous before these fights, man, so... You know, the results can vary, but the feelings before, you know. Um, again, answer with, like, the question, like, how's it heavy for you as, like, a human being, a guy, like, before the fight? Like, what's on the line? What are, what are some of the things you're thinking of besides, like, I'm just going to go kill this guy? Start out by saying, like, what's heavy is. Yeah. I mean, what's heavy, what's what's heaviest to me is, is, is I don't want to let, like the people down. Not that they would necessarily be let down if I lost, but like I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be let. I don't want to let people down. I don't want people to, you know, spend their Friday night coming out to watch me. Like I go out there and lose. You, you know what I mean? So that's that's real heavy for me. That weighs on me a lot. It's more like it's. I people call it performance anxiety. You know what I mean? Not not afraid of your opponent. Don't get me wrong. It's not like oh my gosh, this guy's this this dude's a beast. Like oh man, like I'm scared of this dude. It's like you're more you're worried about yourself. You're worried about how am I gonna perform tonight? You know what I mean? Am I gonna am I gonna fulfill everybody's expectations of me? You know, am I gonna put on a good show? That's to me that's that is what is by far the heaviest part of this. You know? So again, use the question in the beginning of your answer. Like, whose expectations are you worried about letting down? Like tell me the list of people who you <sighs> like so start by saying, like, the people I'm most concerned about letting down yeah. are. I mean, the people I'm most concerned with letting down, I think it's just, like, is my fan base in, in general. There's not, like, a specific person. I've been through, I have such a great fan base here in Connecticut through everything I've been through. Like, these people have rode it out with me. Dude, I was away for four years, you know, get in all kinds of trouble, you know, I'm sure we'll get into that. And so these, these fans of mine, they rode it out for those four years I was gone. There, no one knew it out. You know, the people who knew me, knew me, knew what was going on. There was a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors floating around. But look at tonight. The house is packed again. Those are the people I don't want to let down. The people that stuck with me through my darkest days are the people I do not want to let down. Does that include your wife and your daughter? A hundred percent, yeah. Talk, talk, say, talk about your yeah. wife and your daughter and why, yeah, worrying about letting them down. You know, as far as my wife and my daughter goes, letting them down, you know, they... They wouldn't be as let down if I if I lost. You you know what I mean. They would be let down. You know she, Kay, honestly, Kay doesn't. She didn't want me to get back into it. She didn't even want me to. At first, she was very hesitant about me getting back into fighting after such a long time away. She thought it would be too much pressure for me. You know she thought I wouldn't be able to handle it again and maybe you know, um, maybe go down a a path that I once went down. You know what I'm saying. So. What about your daughter? You think about her, like in terms of your career and like right. even your, you know, your your. Uh, My whole life struggling with drugs and alcohol in your past. Talk about your daughter a little bit, like. Are, yeah, my, maybe maybe that's not someone you're worried about letting down. She no, loves you unconditionally, and you love her. She yeah, no, my things. my hold daughter. On, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, my daughter. You know, everything I do. Everything I do is for her. She keeps my life. And I've, I've had this question a lot in the last, you know, a couple months. You know, like, what does it mean? You know, having a family now, having a daughter. Like, what does it mean to you? And what does it do for you? It does everything. But I would, I would be, I, w I might not be sitting here. And people will say, oh, I'll be dead or in prison. Blah, blah, blah. Like, I came close to dying. And I've been to prison. 
You know what I'm saying? While she was alive, I was in I was in prison. When she was a baby, you know, I spent her first Christmas, I was in prison. When her first birthday, I was in rehab. Like, dude, I did that. I don't want to do that anymore, man. So what she does for me, she keeps me focused now. You know, whether it be fighting or whether it be on my job, being safe at work. You know, I have a dangerous job. You know what I'm saying? And then in the case, she keeps me focused, man. She keeps me focused just on, like, life in general. That's great, man. So has having your daughter and how old is she, has that helped you, like, grow up in some ways and, and to be oh, more responsible? Can you include it in yeah, that I got question? You, yeah. Yeah, you know, her. she's almost three years old, and she's helped me grow up. Sorry, can you start with, like, my daughter's three years old? Yeah, um, my daughter's three years old, you know, almost three. Yeah, she's helped me grow up immensely. I. She's the reason why, you know, when they tell you, you have to, when you get your act together, you do it for yourself. Oh, you're not going to do it until you do it for yourself. But, okay, so while I couldn't do it for myself, I did it for her. You know what I mean? I'm not, I do not want her to have... I don't want her to want for anything, man. So I want to, everything I do is for her. I work hard. I show up to work every day and work my balls off, man. When I'm training, I'm training hard. When I fight and I'm tired out here in these fights, dude, I'm throwing haymakers still for, for her, man. So she can have a, a good life and not want for anything, you know, and be proud of the fact that her dad, you know, one day when she's older and she'll realize, you know, she's going to know. She's going to know my story, man. My story has been well publicized. She's going to know what I went through. She's going to know that her dad was, you know, was a drug addict and went to prison, was in rehab. She's going to know all that. But she's also going to know that her father, dude, pulled himself out of that dark place, dude, and made, and made a fucking comeback. She's going to know that. And that's very important for, for me that she's going to know that. That her dad wasn't defined by those dark times, dude. That I, I, I came out of it, man. You know what I'm saying? And I need her to know that. So. What does it feel like... Um... You know, like when you get home and you had another day clean and uh, maybe you want to fight and your little three-year-old comes up and throws her <laughs> arms around you. Can you, like, include some of that in the answer? Yeah, you know, having these long days. I mean, my days are long, man. Long days at work, long days. Then you go to the gym after. And when I get home, you know, my wife always lets her out. She lets her out on the deck. And then my daughter comes running around and she comes down the deck stairs. And whether I'm dirty... Covered in hydraulic fluid, man. Covered in grease, covered in mud from work. She doesn't care. She jumps right on me, wraps her legs around me, wraps her arms around me. And she squeezes me so tight, she shakes. And it's just like this love that I, I never, you know, you know, this, your parents love you unconditionally, of course. But, like, not until you have a kid and you can feel the love, like, radiating. She squeezes me. And she's, Daddy, Daddy's home. Uh, and, like, you can feel her arms shaking. It's It's, like, real... You know what I'm saying? It's like, real, I, I, you know, it's, it's real love, man. It's like real, and she like can't hold me tight enough, you know. And it's like, oh my gosh, man, it's, it makes it all worth it when I have those tough days. Like, you know, it's easy to go get high, man. It's easy to go get high, you know. It's how, easy. How, how are you? Um, your daughter's one thing. Like, uh, hold on one second. Let me yeah. quick adjustment on something. Um, I'm going to ask you though, as soon as I change this setting, um, your daughter's one thing that keeps you sober. Um, hold on one second. Your daughter's one thing that I'm sure keeps you motivated to stay clean and sober. Um, you know, what else gets you, helps you get through that day? Like, like you've had a, you, you know, you talk about very publicly, which is helpful for other people, your, yeah. your, your struggles. Like, what, what are some of the things that help you get through the day without getting high? And include the questions. You know, you know aside well, from my, yeah. um, aside from my daughter helping me, you know, stay clean every day, um, probation. No, no. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh. No, just, you know, having, like, like you said, um, having like the world know my story, you know, gave me a level of accountability, you know, that I really, um, you know, it's when the whole world knows like what you went through, you know, you, you get that. It's another level of accountability. Like if you now, when I slip up, there's a lot of eyes on me now, a lot of eyes on me, 
You know, like even the commentators and before some of these fights, they're like, hey, you know, what's up? How you doing? Are you good? Like a lot of people question me, you know, and like guys I work with know what I've been through. You know, my family knows. So a lot of people know, you know, what I've been through. And a lot of people, and I'm a dead giveaway. When I start getting high, I'm a dead giveaway. All right? Dude, my, hey, what's up? What's up, babe? She can hear it in my voice on the phone. She can hear it in my voice. And not one time, not one time has she said, you're high right now, and I haven't been high. She's she's never wrong, and it's crazy. And I would tell you if she was, man. She can hear it in my fucking voice. So, you know, to answer the question, man. You know, besides my daughter, it's just my my people at work, the people I train with, the people at the gym. You know, my whole family. I'm super accountable, man. You know, I have a lot of responsibilities. You know, I just it's really not an option for me. You know. So the next fucking big question, though, is like. What about in fucking you? What in you? you talked about your fans. You talked about mm. your girl can hear it in your voice. You got your daughter. Like, when you're alone in a fucking room, yeah. all by yourself, and you're not... Can I be real? Can I be real? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to try to give the whole... Yeah. The um, answer. Yeah. I mean, the question. And the answer. Yeah. What inside, what inside me... You know, and the inter an internal factor that, you know, that keeps me sober, that keeps me straight. Beside, is and I'm gonna be 100 percent real, man. I really don't have one yet. You know, I I left my own devices. That's why, you know, I'm not even my girl is worried to leave me here doing this interview right now by myself, man. I don't. Let me tell you what, man. I I struggle when I'm alone. I struggle. I struggle because I got high for so long. I got high for so long. I, bet I I started getting high. I started doing pills when I was in early high school, dude. And I ran it. I ran it the whole time. I didn't take breaks. And I was highly successful in my life while I was getting high. So it, it's all I ever knew. It's how it's all I ever knew since I was 14 years old. You know what I mean? And I, I hear about these guys who dad, oh, then they got two years clean. Oh, uh, then they, you know, then he used again. Then he had three years clean. Dude, I have no, I have no clean time. Until I got sober about a year ago, I had no clean time. You know what I mean? So it's hard. I'm still trying to figure out inside me, like, what? You know, and it's, it's easy. Just, oh, well, I, I do it for my daughter. And I do it for my job. And I stay clean so I can train. And I stay clean so I don't piss dirty at probation. You know, that's all I use right now. Because I don't have it inside me yet. I don't know why. I. It's hard for me. Left to my own devices, man. I don't, that's why it's tough for me to go out of town for work. Dude, it's tough for me to go out of town to travel. I can't be, tr I can't really be trusted fully yet, you know? So I need the outside factors right now to keep me straight because I, I don't have it inside me yet to, to be, to be 100% clean on my own. I don't, I don't have it. So that's fucking real. Yeah. And on a personal note, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, but stop. It yeah. is. It's minute to minute. Um, So, all right, let's change the subject a little bit. Keep it real, like you keep it, you're, yeah. you're killing it with just like honesty. I got you. All right, so, you know, in, in this promotion, like you walk down that plank, you know, in another promotion, you come out through the fucking gate, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, what are, you, what are you really thinking? Like, some nights I'm sure you're thinking, I got this guy. Some nights you're like, I hope I got this guy. But, like, forget about the guy yeah. that you're facing. Yeah. What's in your head? Like, are you, like, thinking about techniques and how you're going to come out and what the game plan was? Are you worried about your, fan, your, your family or getting a paycheck? I don't know. What are you... So just start out by saying like when I walk out into the arena, here are some different kinds of things that go yeah. through my head. Whatever, however yeah. you want to say it. So like, you know when I walk out into the arena, you know especially, especially at Mohegan Sun. So I fight here a lot. I fight at Mohegan Sun all the time. You know, and the house is always fucking packed. You know, with all my fans are in there, man, and it's great. And you know, so I I really try as hard as I can to like to to uh, have a vision, have an image of what I think is gonna happen out there. You know, I really try to, like, play the tape out in my head. Like, all right, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to impose my will. Like, I'm going to make this my fight. I'm going to make this my match, you know. And I try to really picture, I literally, 
And sometimes I have to force it. Like you said, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm real confident. Like, I'm going to fucking dust this dude. You know, he's getting knocked out. And then other times, you know, you have those demons of doubt. Those demons of doubt, like, sneak up on you. Like, you'll be in the back room. Your hands will be wrapped. And you'll be taking a leap. And you'll, like, picture yourself getting knocked out. I swear. I bet that happens. And it happens to all fighters. You'll see yourself, like, getting dropped. And you'll be like, oh, my God. And you have to, like, get that. No, no, dude, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. You know, and then you'll be like, all right, I'm good. You start hitting the pads again. You're getting warmed up. And on the walk out, you have to just make yourself think. You have to see it. So I try to just make myself see it. I try to make myself visualize the finish that I that I think is going to happen, you know. And are you able to block most everything out at that moment? Like when it's time to really walk out of game on, game time? Like you, you're, that's where it's in your head is like the vision. The, um, like what yeah. I'm going to do when the bell fucking rings. When it's go time and you're walking out that, you know, so, you know, picture it like, man, so picture it like a funnel, right? Like a big ass fucking funnel, right? Picture it like a funnel. So you're in, you're in the back room. So like the day off, right? You wake up in the morning, you're at the top of that funnel. All kinds of thoughts going through your head, man. What am I going to eat? Uh, should I eat this for lunch? I don't know yet. Uh, should I go see my sister? It's her birthday today, which it was, you know, she's due. She's probably having the baby right now. But, you know, so, you, so you, there's all kinds of thoughts. And then as you get closer to the fight, as that funnel's down, you know, now your mind's not on what you're going to have for lunch anymore. It's not on this. It's, all right, when we get in the back room, what am I going to have all my stuff with me? What are we going to do? We're going to do some pads. All right, we're going to get warmed up. Now, as you get down to the bottom of that funnel, that's where you're walking out. Dude, your, your mind is in one place. My mind's in one place, and that is focused on my opponent up there that's waiting for me in the cage because I'm always in the red corner. He's always in the cage waiting for me. Always. I'm always the right corner. I walk out second. And it's it's that visualization, man. It's at that point it's real. At that point, you know, you got ten thousand fans screaming your name, dude. At that point, it is fucking real. And you're not thinking about lunch. You know, you're not thinking about your sister's birthday. You know, you're thinking about one thing. And that's putting a hurting on that dude, you know? So when you're in the cage, like I, I've been a, I've been a fucking MMA fan since like fucking UFC one and Pride, all that shit. Yeah. So, like, I'm interested in this question personally. Yeah. So, when you're in the cage, right, and like, you're not sure if it's going your way because this guy's like hit tagged you. Yeah, yeah. And like, you're now all of a sudden maybe you're just like not sure, and you're like, what happens at that moment? And then where do you where do you dig? Like, where where do you dig into yourself? Do you say, let me regroup, let me rethink, let me re like let me reset my feet, let me fu I'm gonna come with like tell me what happens when you're like in there and you're just like okay, I got to either up this or I'm losing. Yeah. So when you're in there and you don't know if it's going Can your you way. when you're in the ring? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So when you're in the ring and you don't quite know if it's going your way, you know, especially if you're, got, especially if you're getting hit with shots, man. Especially if you're getting hit. If, if you're trading, dude, you could very well be on the giving end of most of those shots. But even if you get hit a couple times, say you get hit like a, like a nice two-piece, that, that sticks out in your head more than you landing shots on him. You know what I mean? So, at that point, it's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to shell up and, and start playing some defense? Or are you going to put the pedal down, put the pedal to the metal, and start and start smashing? And my, what I do, I'm going forward, man. I'm going forward. But where in Brandon Ward's fucking brain, <laughs> in your body, in your soul, whatever the fuck it is that you have to tap into, like... Is it instinct? Is it fighter's instinct? Is it because you've been in the, you know, like, where do you go? Do you say, you're, is it pride? Is it fucking fear of losing? Pick it up with some of what I'm asking yeah. you in the question. Yeah. Like, when I'm getting hit and I need to step up, it comes from where? Say that and then answer it. When I'm getting hit and it's time to fucking step up or I'm going to lose, I think... A lot of it is instinct, and a lot of it's heart, man. A lot of it is heart, because it's fucking... You see fights. You see fights where guys fucking shell up, and they're not quite knocked out, and they're kind of looking at the ref to save them. That's easy to do, and that's that fucking happens, man. Like, when I fought in Japan, dude, this dude was dropping knees on my fucking head, dude, and I am laying in there, fighting a dude way bigger than me, dope sick, and, like, dude, and... So the thought, and I, I've told people this openly, the thought crossed my mind. When that dude was dropping knees on my head, he had my arm pinned down. You watch the video. He's dropping knees. Because in Japan, you can, you know, knee to the head of a grounded opponent. Dude, I said, if I just don't block a couple of these, the referee's going to stop this fight. 
and I'll I'll be done, and I'll be out of here, and this will be all be fucking over, and I'll go fucking find some smack, and I'll be good to go. And then that is just like a glimpsing thought, and then I said, no, fuck that, dude, I'm 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 winning this fight, and that's that's hard because that's not instinct, that's a decision I made right there. That was a decision to block those shots and get back to my feet. So what happened? I got up and fucking kicked him in his head and finished the fight. Knocked him out. Head kicked him, dude. Soccer kicked him, punted his hands right through his face, jumped on his back, choked him out. So then you knock him out. The crowd fucking, I assume, erupts after erupts. a head kick knockout. Erupts. Talk, talk me through that moment. Starting with, I'm down on the ground. Yeah, yeah, the guy's kneeing me, yeah, and I could give up. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm down. Three. So, I'm down on the ground. Saitama Super Arena, fighting the hometown hero in Japan. You know, 70,000 people in the arena. It was crazy. I'm on my back, dropping hellacious knees on my head. And, you know, that, that thought of, I could just not block these right now, and the referee will end it. And, you know, found it in myself. Made the decision that, no, dude, I'm getting back up. So I get scrambled back to my feet. He goes for a single leg, limp leg out of it, soccer kick. You gotta love, you gotta love the Japanese rules, man. Soccer kick him right in the face. He, she shells up. Oh, jump on his back, dude. Crowd, I jump up on the ropes. Crowd goes fucking insane, man, insane. And I'm, I'm thinking that this, I'm not, I'm thinking, I, I'm, I can't win this fight, dude. I have no sleep. I just got done doing. I did my last bag of dope literally three days before I fucking got here. I'm, I'm dope sick. How am I going to win this fight? And I fucking did it, dude. I get up on those ropes. And I just put my, my hands up and the crowd goes nuts. And it was like, dude, I, I felt, oh, it, was, it felt amazing, man. It felt absolutely amazing. That was, that was probably my best moment in, in MMA. 100%. That was like my best moment. How does it feel when 70,000 people just saw you soccer kick a fucking guy in <laughs> Japan? Say that, say like. How does it feel when 70,000 people cheering you and you're on the ropes? Tell yeah. it and then tell us how it feels. I mean, how does it feel Hold when... On. three. How does it feel when 70,000 people are on their feet for you at the Sayatama Super Arena? Man, that, it's a feeling. It's a feeling I'll probably never have again in my life. That's like a once... That's a once-in-a-lifetime feeling, win, winning a fight like that. Losing the fight, coming back, soccer kick to the head, finish out with a choke and jump on the ropes, man, in Japan. It's... It was a feel. I'll never have that feeling again. If I could have bottled that and kept it forever, man, I could have sold that fucking feeling. You know, it was. Th that's one of the best feelings I ever had. You know, that's up there with my daughter being born and all that. You know, one of the best things ever. Now, I mean, it might sound like a silly, obvious question, but like, why? Like, what is it? What is it at its core? Below the surface of seventy thousand fucking people admiring and appreciating your work. Is it validation? Is it like they're celebrating your success and you feel like the hard work I put in, let's not talk about the dope in this particular yep. portion of the segment. Like, what is it about all those people? What are they cheering? And why does it make you feel good? You know, what, what makes you feel so good after a victory like that is, you know, it, it's, it's a lot. A lot goes into that. You know, a lot of it is like relief. Like, oh my gosh, I got this done. I, I, I did what I came here to do. You know, the people appreciate, especially in Japan, they appreciate fighters over there big time. That's, you know, and it's huge. And that, that's such a legendary promotion, you know, rising and pride. And, you know, just to be invited over there to fight was huge, you know. And, uh, like, to me, that's like, the, that's like the core. You know, when I grew up watching MMA, it was, you know, pride, you know. But, like, what are they... When they cheer, what are they cheering for? Like, what is your brain telling you they're cheering for? Include, give, yep, give me yep, the whole... Yep. So, my brain tells me what they're cheering for, that you just put on a show, man. You, you did what you were supposed to do. They are, like, avid fight fans over there. And if they're cheering for, for an American who just beat their, like, Japanese hero, like, you know you're doing something right, man. You know you put on a good show. You did your job. You know, you killed it. So, I was stoked, man. Super stoked. So it's validation. Validation, I guess. I guess you could say that. So when 70, say this, when 70,000 people are cheering, yeah. I, I feel what? Yeah. So when 70,000 people are cheering and they finally validate all that shit you've been doing, all that training you've been doing, it's, it's an unbelievable feeling, man. To know that they, have, that they appreciate what you just did, what you just went through. It's huge, man. Huge. Sweet. It's going great. Getting through it. Um, all right. For 
the average opponent, and let's not talk about a specific opponent or a place, but just like your average opponent, when you're looking at them, when uh, Big John or whoever, you know, touched gloves that moment right before the fight, like, when you're, when you're looking at them right before the bell, what are you thinking about them, the average opponent? The average opponent right before the bell rings, you know, I've, I've been staring you down the whole time. I try, if I'm, I lock eyes with them and I don't, I won't look away. I won't break there. I won't break the, I won't look away. I want to make you fucking look away from me. You know, I've had it so I've been staring the guy down. As soon as we get in the cage, we haven't not, we've been staring at each other the whole time until the bell rings. Until the fucking bell rings. And you, you don't even have to ask. We're not touching gloves. It's like tonight. Or, you know, it's, it's on s several fights. No, you already know you're not touching gloves. Because you've been, like, giving each other the fucking evil eye. For th the whole two minutes they've been introducing us. We've just been locked eyes. Like, yeah. A little head nod. Like, what's up, dude? What's up? Not looking away from each other. You know? And you know he's in there to fucking beat your ass. To 100%. You, you think... Everybody thinks they're going to win. He's not in there like, oh, man, this guy, this guy. They're out there to fucking hurt you. You know? They're out there to hurt you. Have you been in a street fight? I've been in... I've been in more street... I've been in... I forgot about more street fights that I've been in than 99% than of people have ever been in. I forgot about them. I forgot about more fights. I did more street fighting from the time I was 14 to... To twenty, then oh man, those six. All I did was fight. That's all we did was get in street fights, man. When we were younger, that's all we did. You ever get your ass kicked in street fights? I've been I've been jumped in street fights. Yeah, I've been jumped a couple times. Yeah, I've been jumped. Like, I got stomped out. Yeah, I got stomped out a couple times. You know, I uh, I lost a back molar and <laughs> getting getting jumped outside of a nightclub. Yeah, you know we were always. Oh, we scrapping, dude. We were fucking partying and fighting. That's what we did. Sometimes we wouldn't even go out looking for girls. We would just go out and look to fight, you know? That's how we were young and crazy. Uh, are you, so, we just talked about, like, when you're staring this guy down in the ring, that you're, like, I'm going to kick your fucking ass, basically. Mm -hmm. He's going to kick your ass. You just kind of... To paraphrase what you said, that's like roughly what you said. Yeah. But like in real life, outside of the ring, in your life, the human being that is you, what are you scared about in real life? Start with like things. On. Yeah. Uh, things I'm scared of in real life, you know, like real things I'm scared of is, um, you know, I'm, I'm scared of losing my family. I'm scared of losing my family. Um, I'm scared of my, I, I'm scared of what, of, of how I can lose my family. I can, I can lose my family by, you know, if, when I start, part, when I start, if, if I go back to that life of, of drugs and crime again, dude, I will lose everything I've worked so hard in the last couple of years to rebuild, man. And that scares the shit out of me every day, every day, man. You know, cause I don't do, dude, I don't, you know, I don't pussyfoot around. You know, I, when I get high, dude, I'm going to do fucking, I'm going to do the real shit. I'm going, I'm going to do shit that can kill you. You know what I mean? I'm scared of dying, you know, because my, that's where my disease takes me, man. I, I pick right up where I left off and it's not something to be proud of, man. It's not something, but I can't take it lightly. And I have to constantly, constantly remind myself, man, that I can't take it lightly. And if I go back to that life, I could die. And if I don't die, if I don't OD and, or get arrested again, you know, go back to prison, dude. My family will leave me, man. And that's what's that is one of the only things that scares me. You know, that's that's it. That's that's what scares me the most, man. Are you? Are, and I'm sure that pales in comparison. But are like, are, are you afraid of like your career because you've 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 worked so hard and you've attained success? Like, are you afraid of like losing four fights in a row and then getting dropped from a promotion? Like. I'm sure that must be a fear, but probably compared to what you just talked about, it's not comparable. But talk about that if that's a real thing. Yeah. I mean, it's for, like career-wise, being scared of losing my fight career, I'm really not. And I, I'm not going to sound like, I hate to sound like a dick or like some pompous fuck, but like, I know I'm better than, I'm better than most guys, most guys on the roster. Most guys ranked right now ahead of me because I'm, 
I just got back, so I'm not ranked. But I'm better than most of these guys anyways. I feel like I can beat the dudes who have... The, I can beat the guy who has the belt right now. So I don't really worry about losing my fight career. You know? Um, I, I worry about losing my family. Because that can happen to me so fast. And, and people... You know, unless you've been there, unless you've been down that road of addiction or it's directly touched your life somehow, unless you or a, a family member has has dealt with it, you don't realize how fast you can lose everything. You don't, people don't understand it, dude. It's, it, you can lose it so fast. I mean, I'm on probation. I have a huge suspended sentence. If I violate probation, my PO can literally put me back in prison for seven years. Dude, if I, and what? So what, I'm going to drive around and go to Hartford and cop bags after work, dude, and get caught with bags? Because what, when I start doing bags, I start selling bags too. You know what I'm saying? And then what, get caught with 10 bundles in my fucking truck? Dude, in a company work truck? Lose my job, lose my family, go back to prison for seven years. Dude, that can happen in two days. That can happen just if you go do a, if you go get a perk set tonight. If I had a perk tonight, I would be doing fentanyl in, on Tuesday. I'm serious. And then your life is gone. Dude, it can flip on you so fast, man. When you're a hardcore addict like that, it can flip on you, man. And, and, and your whole life will be over. Like that, and that really fucking scares me. Because like we said earlier, I don't have it in myself to like, no, Brandon, you can't, we can't do that. Like, man, I, I, I ask myself all the time. I'm like, dude, if someone just came up, if some random dude came up to me who didn't know me, some fight fan, hey, man, I got a couple blues. You want a couple blues? Oh, and no one was around me? What would I say to that? I, I like to say I would be like, no, nah, I'm good, man. But who the fuck knows? Dude, it's scary shit. So that's what scares me. Is, is what happens if I start using again and what could happen? I could lose fucking everything and be sitting in a fucking prison cell until I'm fucking 40 something years old. Fuck that. That's scary shit, man. That's real scary shit. Um, how do you know that you could fucking beat the guy with the belt? Start, include that question in the answer. How Three, do I, two. How do I know I can beat the guy with the belt? Styles, man. Stylistically speaking, you know he's a good, he's a great wrestler. He's a good wrestler, but I don't think he can take me down. And I know I have better hands than him, and I have way more power than he does. You know, there's some guys ranked underneath him that that would give me a harder time than he would. I'll, t I'll tell you that. You know, and uh, yeah, I only got two fights back in right now. You know, I'm only a couple fights back off a long layoff, and uh, but that that time's gonna come where I'm gonna have to step up in the competition and and. Uh, you know, the top guys in my weight class, they know. They, they, they you know, I, I've been in this promotion longer than all of them. I've been with Bellator since 2011. I fought for a world title. You know what I mean? I fought for a title. I just fell off, you know, because of my own doing. Of course, you know, I, you know, I uh, self-destructed a little bit, but I'm back now, you know, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a title. I'm going to have a belt. You think, so you think you'll be champion. Get it, come, use the full question and answer. Three. Yeah, I I think I'll be champion. I think I will, I'll have a belt. I will have the 170 pound belt um, within two years in in Bellator. I'll have it within two years. Yeah, for 100. percent What are some things in your life that you, if you could, that you would do over? Oh man. Um. If I had, if I could do, if I had an opportunity to redo a couple things in my life and uh with the knowledge I have now it would be I would have never I, I would have never I would have never started using opiates I would have never you know if I could have intervened if you know if the 33 year old version of myself could have intervened the 14 year old version of myself you know when I had a bottle of oxycodone you know and I was seeing them on the new oh this is what they're talking about let me fucking try these things out uh, 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 uh. Cause that's it's like, dude. I, I never felt that, and I never felt a feeling that good, ever. And I've been chasing that feeling. You know, I've been for twenty years. I'll be thirty four. Twenty years I've been chasing that fucking feeling, man. I would have, no. I would have stopped. I would have found a way to intervene and not let myself start using opiates. That's been my number one downfall, of my entire life. That's been my number one. I built my life back up. Started using. Blew it away again. Started use, you know, it's, it's just a story of my life, man. You know, I would have never started using opiates ever. Is there anything else that comes to mind, like in 
personal relationships and starting your career earlier and making different career decisions in school and fucking life and kids and blah blah anything else if not it's okay but if there is do we you know I'm, there was really not the, the dr drugs played a huge role in, in every aspect of my life you know drugs played a role in me not finishing college you know drugs played a role in me taking too much time off between fights Drugs played a role in me not taking fucking fights. Dude, I got offered. I fought and lost for the title at 185. Dropped down to 170. Rattled off four wins in a row. Got offered a title shot at fucking 170. And didn't take it because I was off on a bender. Like, dude, like everything everything negative in my life and every opportunity missed is, is like a direct, is directly related to fucking drugs, man. So if I could have just eliminated that, there would be every other, oh, I wish I didn't do this. Oh, I wish I did that. They would just, there would be nothing. Not maybe, not necessarily nothing, but there would be a lot less if I never fucking started doing drugs. Oh, training hard, working hard, working hard in my job, training hard when I can train, get big fights, get a belt, and, and go to work every day in, in, in support, man. And then my worst future, holy fuck, dude, it's like the opposite of that, you know? I, I had someone say that to me one time, man, and they really put shit in perspective for me. They're like, you you are like a black and white guy. There's no gray area for me. They're like, this, this guy told me, he's a good friend. I've known this kid for a long time. He's like, you're the kind of guy, you have no gray area. He's like, you can be so great, you know, with the fighting and the, you know, and the talented welder and whatever, all that bullshit. He's like, but at the same time, you have the potential to just be a fucking, like, dirtbag in, in prison. He's like, you, you are just like this fucking... These two paths that are polar opposites. And it's hard for me to be... There's like no gray area for me. I'm, I'm all in. I'm either being a dirtbag fucking drug addict, dude. Or I'm doing fucking good, working hard, training hard, winning fights, and bringing money home to the family. Or I fucking take a left. So my 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 best future and my worst future are so... I can easily attain both of those. I can be a fucking dirtbag next week and have my worst future can be right here. In two weeks, dude, I could be back in the fucking pen doing a fucking eight-year bid, seven-year bid. Or in two years, I can have the belt and have it all. That's it's wild. It's crazy. Bro, you think you could handle, like, being the fucking one, what, 170? 170, 170, yeah, 170, 170 champion with the money and the fucking belt and the accolades. Like, play that scenario out for me. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. Hold on. Three. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Handling, handling... You know, being the champ, I was almost the champ when I was in my early 20s. And I had the money. I won the tournament, dude. I won. I had all kinds of money, all kinds of freedom. I had no responsibilities. I couldn't handle it. I could not handle it. You know, I had, too, I had too much money and too much freedom and too much, you know, not fame, but, you know, but I, I just had too much. I thought I was like the fucking man. I thought I was going to last forever. And I found out quick that it does not last forever, man. And I blew that shit. I blew it. I completely blew my my first go around at this. If I win the title at this stage of my life, start with that. If I win the title at this stage of my life, I'll handle it way better than I did than I did when I was younger. Way better. You know, I'll make better I'll make better decisions. You know, I'm I'm you know, I'm at a more stable point in my life. You know, I have a family now, I got a I I got a you know, my girl, my my daughter. You know, I, I own a house. You know what I'm saying? I have, like, a real job. You know, I would be able, I would handle the fame and the, you know, the having that title a lot better now. You know, I would, I, would, I would respect it more. I would definitely respect it more. Awesome. Um, earlier, we were talking about, like, how you're training at your day job, in yeah. essence. Oh, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, my day job, it's, my day job's tough, man. You know, we're, we're union carpenters, but we have a specialty, you know, we're, we're, we call ourselves pile drivers, you know, we, uh, we do a lot of deep foundations and, um, you know, a lot of, well, a lot of drilling, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we, uh, we pretty much do deep foundations for bridges and all kinds of, you know, structures on the water as well, you know, and, uh, it's hard, man. We work with cranes, everything's heavy, a lot of rigging, you know, a lot of welding, a lot of burning with torches. It's just like a dirty, gritty, f real physical job. You know, we got scar. My hands are covered with burn scar, you know, from burning with settling torches and welding all day. And, you know, it's a physical job. It's real physical. But, you know, every man in my family is in the trades. So, like, when you're... And it goes, also goes from the area I'm from. This is a big blue-collar, 
area where I'm from, man. Everyone's in construction. All the all my friends and you know. If another fighter or coach looks at you and says something like, "That guy doesn't train as much as my guy," how does your day job fit in playing uh, that? <laughs> you know, if when when people do, because they do, when people speculate that I may not train as much as some of the other fighters down at American Top Team and Stanford MMA and all these big MMA schools, you know, these these coaches who think I don't train as much as their guys should send their guys to work with me for a week. And they, if they can make it a week, if they if they wouldn't die, like I said like I said earlier, if they didn't die and get crushed by something, like like fucking hour one, you know, if we could somehow get put these guys through like an accelerated apprenticeship program and they could come to work with me, they wouldn't last. They wouldn't last a fucking week. They wouldn't. They just it's not it's not what these fighters do, man. I, I feel these fighters when I shake these fighters' hands they have these soft fucking piano, like piano hands. You know, dude, my hands are covered with calluses and fucking burns, dude. And my hands are, I have to wear like a fucking, a large glove. You know, our hands are all beefed up from what we do, man. And that's our life around here. It's like Pennsylvania with the coal miners. It's the same deal. And you're from the Northeast, dude. And you're, you're from these blue collar towns in the Northeast, dude. You work construction. You work fucking hard. And we do. And we take pride in that. I take pride in the fact that fucking none of these fighters, man, could come and fucking... Could come fuck with me on my job site, man. No way. They'd never make it. Uh, back to back, what was your lowest moment in your life or career? And what was your best moment? Just in a quick little 30 second combine it to. Yeah. Three. Uh, uh, lowest moment in my career was getting released by Bellator. Um, you know, after, you know, getting arrested, after going to prison and, uh, all that, and uh, the best moment was, it was in Japan, it was triumphing over, you know, that, what I was going through in my life, flying all the way across the world and getting that big win in Japan, it was my best moment. Are you humble, or are you confident in your career? Oh, man, you know, you, you know, the, the whole, the whole, my, my level of, humi of humility in my career, you know, as far as, so my, my, my work, my, my, my union job, you know, is we, you, you have to be, you have to be real confident in what we do. Because a lot of times, you know, we run into problems on the job site, man, and we have to, we have to, we got to come up with a fucking answer right now. You know, there's no one to ask. Hey, what, uh, hey, what should we do? Like, we got to come up with shit right now, right here, right now. So there's a level, you, you can't sit back and question yourself, well, shit, you have to be confident, man, and confident in your ability, confident in your fucking skills, you know, to get that job done. As far as fighting goes, you have to be confident as well, man. You know, I can, man, you know, you, you got to be, you, you have to assert your dominance out there. You, you do. It's a fuck, it's an alpha sport, man. It's a fucking alpha sport. So you have to know that you're, that you're better. You have to know it. Even if you don't think you are, you have to like fucking convince yourself that you are. That you deserve to be there. You know? I deserve to fight this guy, man. I deserve to fucking win. I work harder. I'm fucking better than you. You know? So that's that's how it's got to be. You know? Who are your three... This is just a random one. I'm just curious about while I'm looking at the next questions. Who are, like, three of your all-time favorite MMA fighters? Three of my all-time favorite MMA fighters, man. You know, they're all going to be similar guys. Like, you know, Vanderlei Silva. Because he fucking... Dude, because he just wanted to brawl, man. You know? Uh, uh, Chuck, you know, and these are guys probably everyone says Chuck Liddell because he just had an awesome style. He just wanted to bang, and uh, I really like Chael Sonnen too. I really like Chael Sonnen. You know, I think he's a guy where a lot of guys wouldn't be. Like, oh, he's my favorite fighter. But if you thought about it, man, he really is fucking awesome. You know, he's beat a lot of guys, and he's a great wrestler, and he's a great striker, and he's funny as hell. So I like those those three guys are probably some of my favorites. So. When you were just talking about that, and I was, I was telling your wife earlier, uh, or I think I was telling, no, I was telling uh, Dave, um, like that sequence when Anderson Silva dropped Forrest Griffin, you know, first Anderson's just like, boo, boo, he does a matrix on him, and then while they're moving backwards and Forrest is advancing, he just fucking drops him with a straight left or yeah, right. Yeah, straight left. Yep. Can you describe in like some kind of like, poetic or like the way how it's beautiful to you like a moment in MMA that like sticks in your memory between two other fighters I think a moment of uh, it truly is a beautiful moment in MMA history and everyone will know what I'm talking about is 
Vanderlei Silva and Brian Stan. If people have to remember that exchange, they're, they're, these two landed more bombs. I'm talking fucking face to face bombs. Stan drops, pops up more bombs. Vanderlei drops, pops back up, and then finally Vanderlei finished them off. But that was the that's the best exchange in MMA history. Why? Right there, because you got two guys that are both obviously hurt. Both obviously on fucking Queer Street, dude. Can't even barely stand. And they have all their heart and soul into every punch. And they know it's the end. They know that one of them is lo is losing right now. Dude, you just kiss the dice and fucking roll them. That's that's beautiful, man. That's that's what this sport is all about. That's what this sport's all about. Yo, if you enjoyed that unedited peek behind the scenes, an incredibly raw and compelling interview with the great Brandon Ward, please subscribe to my channel. It would mean a lot to me and enable me to give you more content like this.